Module 5. Growth and Development is our concept. The chapters you were to review and read for this presentation are chapters 17, 18, and 19. It's all about the babies. My name is Lynn Whitmer. I'm a full-time faculty member at Rasmussen College in Ocala, Florida. I'm a certified nurse midwife and a women's health nurse practitioner. I've been with the college several years and I welcome you into this module. As you can see from our pictures, we have babies in all different states. States of awake, states of sleep, states of, states of anger, um, states of anxiety, and states of bliss, where they're just sleeping through everything. That's the blessings I think babies get. But we have to recognize babies of all cultures, all diversities, and all temperaments. And it's something else we will be discussing as we go through this. The temperaments are genetic aspect. And there are three types of temperament. There's the easy child, difficult child, and the slow to warm child. Now, can we change their temperaments? No, we cannot. Can we influence the temperaments? Yes, we can. We can influence the temperaments or their behaviors, manifestations of their temperaments, by the way we interact with them. So it's nice if we can include parents in our discussions of what type of um, temperament we think this baby might be. And there's testing to identify that later on. So that if they're having some, if they have a baby who's a difficult child, and they happen to be a, of a difficult temperament, they're just going to continually butt heads, and they're not going to accomplish anything. So we need to tell the parents in what ways you can interact with this child to make it a smooth transition or a much more beneficial bonding experience. So let's move on. Now, if you can open this screen up to full screen, it probably is to your benefit. If you want to type in questions, please do so. I would advise though, that you keep your questions on a separate piece of paper and then email them to me at the end of the presentation since I am not viewing this live. This has been recorded for you. It's all about babies. So the transition to extrauterine life, very important. The most immediate assessment, of course, is breathing. And you're going to find some more information about that on page 542 and 543 of your current textbook. Breathing is essential, but it's not only the initiation of the breathing, but it's the maintenance. All babies will take that first breath because it's from the mechanical squeeze and some of the chemical changes of hypoxia that cause that baby to take that first breath. But without the advent of surfactant in the lungs to keep the lungs from sticking together, they may not continue to breathe. And so it's our role as an RN and our responsibility not only to hear them make that first cry, take that first breath, but to continue breathing. And so we need to help them with that. We do that several ways. One is with thermal regulation, and one is with stimulation. Using a bulb syringe also helps clear some of the airway of any type of mechanical obstruction, such as meconium or any other thick mucus. Amniotic fluid is relatively thin, but they may have some other mucoid discharge in the lungs, as you have, and it takes a while to clear that out. So you have a bulb syringe in every crib. In fact, that's a safety issue. There should be a bulb syringe in every crib while the baby is still a, a patient of the hospital. The next thing we're looking for, of course, is anomalies. Do you see any gross or avert anomalies? Anything uh, that you note is really wrong with the baby. What's the activity of the baby? He should be moving all extremities freely. His posture should be of a flexed position. This is a normal <clears throat> uh, defense response that they have to keep their core covered. And so their arms and legs are usually close to their chest or their abdomen. If this baby is flaccid, that is an anomaly. And we need to identify why this baby is flaccid and why he's still lethargic. Because then the next problem will be the breathing issue. So posture, you're looking at posture, and you're looking at color. We should see a baby relatively move from a gray, purplish color to a pink color with some acrocyanosis. And if you recognize your new terminology, acrocyanosis is the blue tinge of hands and feet. This is a normal phenomenon because it takes a while for the circulation to become complete and include hands and feet. So a blue hands and feet, a tinge, not a complete blue, but a tinge of the hands and feet being a little bit of a pallor or blue color is a normal phenomenon of the circ immature circulation that is trying to catch up with this new demand of oxygenated blood. So those are the first things that we're going to assess when we look at our babies. And in the meantime, we're kind of um, we're rubbing them down, we're trying to dry them off, and we're assessing all of those things at the same time. Then we're going to be looking at APGAR scores, and we're going to mention that in just a second. 
Please remember the APGAR scores are done at one and five minutes, not immediately. So you have to give the baby a full minute before you score them or his scores would not be good. It is a scoring system of a total of 10, two points for five different parameters. And those parameters we're going to look at in just a minute. Dr. Virginia APGAR was the initiator of this process and it still holds true today. We use it as a method to identify how intensively we need to um, resuscitate. It also gives an idea of how well the laboring process went. Then there's thermoregulation. What we want to do is maintain the baby's body temperature. They're not very good at that yet. It's an immature system. And babies are born with a layer of brown fat. And this brown fat has um, high levels of glycogens, which helps with the thermogenesis, their need to survive. Babies that are born without brown fat have a little more issue or a little more difficulty um, transitioning into extrauterine life and maintaining their temperatures. And those babies would be, of course, your premature baby or your small for gestational age baby or a baby with IUGR. And we have mentioned what IUGR is in prior lectures. So those are the babies that are at risk. Now, which babies are at risk for developing IUGR? We need to take your brain back just a little further. It would be the babies under the influence of hypertension possibly diabetes, if it's a perfusion issue, um, anybody who, uh, mom who's a smoker, mom who used drugs during her pregnancy, or mom with poor nutrition where the baby just didn't gain enough weight. So thermoregulation is key. There is no baby in our world, in our United States medical system that should ever suffer from cold stress because we have the equipment, we have the knowledge to keep these babies warm. Then the other key is to educate the parents so they also understand babies have to be covered and kept covered pretty intensely in the first few hours, if not the first 24 hours, to help them so they have some time to learn how to regulate the temperature. We keep hats on the baby's heads because as you've recognized in former lectures, the head is the biggest part of the baby's body, and so we want to keep the hat on so they do not lose heat through that way. There are four methods in which you lose heat, and it's called CREC. One is convection, radiation, evaporation, and conduction. And so putting babies in a cold environment, putting them in an, in an area where there's cold air blowing on them, putting them into a bed that has cold clothing or a cold um, equipment, of course, is going to help them lose heat. And evaporation, of course, so that's why we want to get them dried off pretty efficiently. What we normally do is have um, a couple really warm towels in the crib that's going to accept them, and a couple of really warm blankets, a warm hat, and of course we would warm up a stethoscope and our thermometer. We can't warm the thermometer, but making sure it's not ice cold, obviously, before we place it next to their skin. So you want to wipe them down, get all the amniotic fluid off of them, and then wrap them in two warm blankets with a hat before we hand them over to mommy and daddy to, to bond and visualize. If indeed you have the birth of the baby and the bonding taking place immediately on mom's chest, just ensure that there are two or three blankets over the baby to maintain the heat that's on mom, because eventually she'll start to cool down as well when the ambient temperature of the room starts to change her body temperature. So you want to ensure that she stays warm and then that baby stays warm, or just keep baby underneath mom's two or three blankets that she has with her after the birth. Okay, so cold stress is unacceptable in this day and age and you have to do everything you can to prevent cold stress. And we may have to re-educate parents because they don't like the goofy little hats we put on the babies. They don't like having them wrapped up in all those blankets. They want to put their pretty little cute new blanket on their baby. Remind them we're going to do that, all those things after the bath, um, but also remind them that babies do get cold easy and we have to protect them, if not just for the first couple days anyway. So thermoregulation, essential. Moving on to your next slide, we're going to talk about APGARs. Again, Virginia APGAR, Dr. Virginia APGAR developed this mnemonic or this very simplistic measuring tool so that we can look at baby's extrauterine life transition. So we're looking at appearance. If we take her name, it becomes the mnemonic for you. Baby's appearance, again, color. This is where we look at color. And they get up a score of one or two. One if they are pale, zero, zero if they're pale, one if they're with some blue tinge around their hands and feet, and two points if they're pink. Pulse, so we're looking at heart rate. Again, they get a zero for no heart rate. They get a one for less than 100, 
and they get a 2 if their heart rate is greater than 100. We can either identify heart rates by listening to apical pulses, so auscultating the apical pulse, or you can actually palpate the umbilical cord initially after birth if you do it close to the stem or where it's embedded into the abdomen and you pinch that a little bit and you can actually feel the baby's pulsations of the heart, which will give you a very accurate finding for the first few hours. So you can tap on the bed or whatever, but you want to identify what the baby's heart rate is. Again, we're doing this at one minute and at five minutes. And babies should transition and the number should get better, stay the same or get better with time. Grimace, if we place a bulb syringe by their face, they should try to move their face away or they should give you this look like, are you kidding me? <coughs> or if you tap the bottom of their feet, they should react. So it's a reflex. We're looking at reflexes somewhat. So again, if they have no response, that's a zero. If they have a very mild response, like, yeah, you got a little bit of it, their attention, that's a one. But if you get a full response, that's a two. Activity, is this baby moving his extremities spontaneously? And when you're looking at extremities moving, they should be moving symmetrically as well. So watch for that. You don't want to see one side flaccid and the other side very active. That's a sign of some type of neurological deficit. So you're looking for spontaneity as well as symmetry in activity. So again, no activity or a flaccid baby would give you a zero. A baby with some extension of his extremities and movement when you touch him or pull on his extremities would be a one. And then if he's fully spontaneously moving because he's pretty angry at you right now, you took him out of his warm, cozy environment, that he gets a full two. Respiratory rate, I believe I may have spelled that incorrectly, I apologize. Respiratory rate, we've already discussed, it should be from 30 to 60. These are diaphragmatic or belly breathers, so we have to watch their abdomens or put our hands on their abdomens. We should also be listening to the chest because it should start clearing. Initially, it's going to sound pretty wet as they're trying to clear that fluid, but um, as time progresses, we should be hearing less and less of the fluid sounds, the crackles, and more of a just clear respiratory rate. And again, it's going to be irregular initially because they don't have the rhythm yet. They haven't figured everything out. They're still trying to clear. But respiratory rate should be from 30 to 60 um, per minute and sometimes a little faster or slower based on what their activity level is right now. So no respiratory rate or no respirations, no attempt to breathe is a zero. If they're at least attempting to breathe, though it is labored and sporadic, they would get a one. And if they have a nice regular, regular rate or if they have their uh, respiratory rate is 30 to 60, then we know that we're in good shape. And then, of course, then their color is going to improve. Again, we do these APGAR scorings at one in five minutes. The most common loss of APGAR scores for color, they usually get only a one for color because of the acrocyanosis. Um, very rarely do we have a baby with a full score of 10. It has happened, but it is rare. So um, you're usually going to get a score of 8 and 9, 9 and 9, 7 and 9. Those are all within the normal parameters. When we start falling below 7, we call that a moderate compromise and we need to offer them something, probably oxygen. Oxygen is what they need right now that will help both for perfusion and oxygenation and the lung uh, base. So you want to give them a little blow by oxygen. If you're in a severe compromise where they're not breathing or attempting to breathe or their circulatory system is very poor and they are flaccid and pale and their heart rate is less than or right at 100, we're going to give them some blow by. I'm sorry, we're going to give them actually a bag and mask. now. And we keep bagging these babies until they fight so hard or their respiratory rate and their um, heart rate comes up to within a normal limit. Most times you're going to hear the babies crying and with this muffled cry through the mask. So crying is also a method in which we identify respiratory rate too. If they're crying, we know they're breathing. So that's what we look for. But do not hesitate to resuscitate a baby. Time lost is time spent on brain cells. So think about that if you're hesitating. Don't hesitate. It's OK. You've, at the very least, give them some extra blow by oxygen. And if that doesn't seem to be enough with stimulation, then go ahead and put the bag and mask on and just give them a few puffs and see what happens. You cannot, as long as you're using a mask with a pop-off valve so you can't um, over-inflate their lungs, we're good. 
So that is your APGAR score. And that is one of the initial things that are done at birth. And parents get very excited because they hear these numbers, 9-9. Nine, nine, and mom freaks. And she says, oh my gosh, my baby weighed 9 pounds, 9 ounces. Like, no, 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 that's his score. He's very happy. He's very good. And again, this graph is in your module for you to print off if you choose, which will help you kind of identify. It doesn't follow the APGAR. Um, maybe it does follow the APGAR. No, it does not. It does not follow the APGAR mnemonic of her name, uh, Virginia APGAR's name, but it's also the five parameters that we're looking for, and it gives you a little better explanation of how to um, assess those babies. If you're in the labor and delivery suite, you're at the birth of a baby, I challenge you to try to identify what the APGAR scores are before the nurse provides the information. You could be right or wrong, doesn't matter. Keep it to yourself. You might be very surprised at how close you are to the actual APGAR score that is given to the baby on his medical record. This is a legal number that's given to them. Normal vital signs for a baby now that we know the APGARs are good. We've done our thermal regulation. We've dried our babies off. He's stimulated. He's pink. He's happy. He's flexed. He's looking around the room. And he's relatively quiet at this moment. So we need to assess very clearly what his heart rate is. And the heart rate should be anywhere between 110 or 120 to 160 beats per minute based on the activity he's been doing. Now, sometimes his heart rate will go a little higher because he's a little more active, and sometimes it might go a little lower, but we need to alert someone if it falls below that 100, 110 beats per minute. This starts to be a borderline bradycardia, and we want to ensure that there's not something else going on. If there is a problem, we want to alert somebody. We may need to give some oxygen. We're probably going to take him to the nursery and probably put in an IV and monitor him a lot closer to figure out what's going on. Babies who are septic, who have an infection that we can't see, this is one of the ways respiratorily and cardiac system is going to be affected first. <clears throat> Respiratory rate, again, 30 to 60 respirations per minute. And we put our hand or we watch their abdomen. Their chest does rise and fall, but not as easily as their abdomen. However, in respiratory distress, if a baby's having retractions where the chest is actually being pulled in, or if he's having nasal flaring, or if you can hear some grunting. Some baby, some mommies think the grunting sound is the coolest sound because it sounds like they're cooing. They're indeed not cooing, but it is the initiation of some respiratory distress. And we need to pay very close attention to that because respiratory distress will only get worse if we do not intervene. So if you see retractions, nasal flaring, or hear some grunting, pay close attention. Look at the volume. Look at what he's doing. And you cannot do respiratory assessments without taking off the t-shirt and really looking at the chest. Now again, nurses who've been in the field for many years have a standard that they use. And they get very comfortable with their assessments. You're new at this. Take the t-shirt off or at least open up the blankets and look at their chest and their belly and watch. Temperature. Temperature, again, they have trouble regulating their temperature at first. And the people at risk are the IUGR or your SGA babies. Some of your macrosomic babies might be a little bit uh, too, because it isn't necessarily brown fat that they have, but just additional fat in their bodies. And what do we do? We keep them under the warmer. You're going to keep them under a warmer. And of course, you keep them relatively naked under the warmer so that the heat from the heating element can get to their skin. If you place them under there with a lot of blankets, you're not really helping the system. You need to open up the blankets and let the heat pour on them. If they're going to be under the warmer, however, you must use a thermometer that is attached to the machine. It's called a servi probe or server probe. And it lays on their uh, soft tissue so that we can regulate their temperatures. And the machine will increase or decrease its radiating heat based on what the baby's skin temperature is. Okay, So temperature is obtained axillary in the delivery room. Once we get to the nursery, we're going to do a rectal temperature on the baby, probably only one time. And that's to identify not only core temperature, but also to give us the, the knowledge whether the rectum is patent. All right, because we would want to identify that relatively quickly to prevent any type of obstruction. So the temperature is anywhere from 36.5 to 37.2 on a baby. Um, and you're going to want to watch that pretty carefully. We do take vital signs every four hours on a newborn. Again, and then we're also assessing them much more frequently, looking for any color changes or activity changes, eating pattern changes that might give us a hint that there's something amiss or something changing. Also look for central cyanosis, which is around their mouth 
or into their neck and their chest. This is a much more significant cyanotic situation, which might be suggestive of a cardiac defect. If they have a cardiac defect, of course, we would order an echocardiogram, start oxygen, monitor vital signs. They may even want to start an IV to help with the perfusion a little bit. All right? So those are some of the basic things we're going to do. Let's break down each system now, and I'm just going to do this very uh, cursory because I want you to look at your book and read your textbook about this. The blood itself, there's different parts. Um, there's about 300 milliliters of blood volume in each baby. So if we lost even 10 or 15 milliliters of blood, that's a significant blood loss which, should ha which will need to be replaced. If we indeed want to give more fluids to a baby, we have to be very cautious because an increase in volume could cause ICP or intracranial pressure. So we want to titrate our fluids very carefully per doctor's order and in fact ensure that we talk with the physicians very carefully about what we're doing and why so, so that we don't have a cause to increase fluids too rapidly. So blood volume is one thing, different parts. Platelets should be about the same as an adult's platelet level. RBCs flip from fetal red blood cells to adult red blood cells, and that takes time. And in, the, in, in between making the adult mature adult fetal, uh, mature adult red blood cells and breaking down the fetal red blood cells, they have to process through the liver. Well, processing through the liver, which is immature, um, isn't very efficient, and so we have some byproducts of bilirubin from that, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. The other thing is the white blood cells. Again, they're there. Um, they may be a little higher than what you would expect, but again, the baby has been through a traumatic event, the birth itself. It may have sustained a little bit of a hematoma or some other issues during the birthing process. So don't be surprised if white counts are somewhat elevated. It doesn't necessarily mean an infection initially. But also recognize that white blood cells may not recognize foreign bodies right away because, again, they're a little immature, and it may take a while for them to respond. So hence, if a baby is delivered or born with a fulminating infection from mom, such as a herpetic infection or a um, varicella infection or CMV, most of these are viral infections, they may not survive it because they do not know how to fight off the infection, number one. And it's a viral infection, which, which we have no cure for necessarily. So it's very good if we, that is one of the reasons for prenatal care, talking to patients, um, encouraging them to be open and honest about anybody they've come into contact with or any unusual rashes that they've acquired or any type of herpetic lesions that they have noted. So all of those things go hand in hand. Talking about the liver, the liver again is immature because it did not need to function while in utero. The placenta took care of all the toxification, detoxifying of all the uh, substances for the baby. So the liver was n did not need to be functional. Remember, we had a bypass. Through fetal circulation, there was a bypass away from the liver. So yes, the liver was getting blood volume, but it wasn't getting enough to make it functional. So. Um, and we're, I'm not going to speak about the glucose right now, but the bilirubin. Bilirubin is a problem which is a byproduct of the breakdown of red blood cells. And so, so if the baby's had any traumatic event, if the baby um, is breastfeeding not efficiently, if the baby uh, was a mom from a mom who is diabetic, may have polycythemia, so there's more red blood cells to break down, we may have a higher risk of bilirubin, and we need to watch for that. Of course, bilirubin translates into jaundice, meaning the baby's skin and sclera will be in a yellow color. Sometimes it's pretty subtle at first as it's changing, and sometimes it's very overt. But we need to be watching for those subtle changes, because kernicterus, which is rare but very traumatic, traumatizing to the baby's brain, needs to be uh, recognized quickly. And that would be at the high end of bilirubin that would has gone unchecked. GI and digestion, um, the belly has a very small capacity, about the size of a little marble. Um, they're saying in your textbook about 15 mLs. Um, some babies can manage 30 mLs initially, but if we're going to bottle feed a baby, we're going to feed him about every three to four hours and no more than an ounce for the first week. And then we can slowly start increasing intake as the baby gives us hints, because now he'll recognize being hungry and being um, full at different times. 
Regurgitation is very normal because they have a very immature uh, digestive system at this point. The uh, cardiac sphincter may not close really efficiently initially, so they may have a little bit of spitting up or regurgitation. So it's always good to hold your baby upright while you're feeding them. You almost have to do that when you're breastfeeding unless you're in the bed. Um, holding them in a more of a semi-fowlers or somewhat uh, recumbent position to feed so that he has the ability to get that food into his belly and it doesn't sit there and regurgitate quickly. The other issue, of course, is meconium. That is the baby's poop. And he, he should pass meconium within 24 hours of birth normally. If he has an ileus or where he does not pass this meconium, one of the first signs of cystic fibrosis is a meconium ileus and you need to pay very close attention to that. Otherwise, maybe he does not have a patent rectum or anus, and so we need to recognize why he's not passing stool. So we're listening to the bowel, and we're watching for passing a meconium. He should pass it within 24 hours of birth. If he doesn't, we need to alert someone. And then how often does he stool? That's really based on the volume of food and how much food he's eating and how well his digestive system is um, working together, how the peristalsis is working together. Bowel sounds will be heard audibly within the first few hours of delivery and that they're suggesting that's usually from all the gas air he's um, inhaled or swallowed during the birthing process or av with all the crying and all the stimulation that we do initially at birth. GU system, the kidneys should be functional after birth. And immunologically they get both active and passive acquired immunity from mom. Um, active means she's had the disease and she, or she's been exposed and she's built up immunities that she's passed to the baby and passive that which she's already had and is passing it off. Now baby will acquire some of his own immunity once he's born. Those who breastfeed will acquire it much faster than babies who are bottle fed. So babies that are breastfed tend to not get have so many upper respiratory or other illnesses. One of the be benefits to breastfeeding of course. Some of the normal newborn care then that we're going to provide. After a baby is born, of course, we're maybe having to suction. You'll need to know the difference between bulb suctioning and deep suctioning, why we would do one or the other, and what are the parameters of the equipment that we use. And again, I caution you, there should always be a bulb suction in each crib. That is a safety issue in our facility for sure. Infection control, hand washing is essential when we're dealing with these newborns. We just talked about the fact that they don't fight infection very well. So be prepared. Um, we need to encourage all mommies as they're passing their baby around to all the relatives that the relatives are also washing their hands. Um, again, because they want to look at the baby, they want to touch, they want to kiss on, they want to put their fingers in their mouth, they want to hold them, and they want to have them squeeze their finger. And when they do that, of course, then their hands go into their mouth. So we want to encourage great hand washing dealing with babies, especially babies that go back and forth into a newborn nursery because a spread of a staph or strep infection throughout the nursery is devastating. ID banding is one of the things that are done in the delivery area, if it be in their postpartum room or in a bona fide delivery or C-section room, the banding has to take place before the baby is separated from its mother. So there's a four band system, two adult bands, one for the mother and one for someone she designates and then two other bands for babies, one usually on the arm and one on the, on the foot and one of those bands also has a, the hugs tag or the security tag included. This ID band will have a number, a specific number, only for those four bands. It will have the uh, mother's last name. It will have date of birth, probably the physician that uh, delivered, maybe some other ancillary information, but it will be mother's last name. And I know some of the mothers who are not necessarily married to the fathers, the fathers get a little upset about this, but that is the only person we know this baby has come from. We know it came out of that mom, but we do not know who the father is necessarily. Medications that we're going to give to the baby initially is eye ointment, the erythromycin. Ointment usually goes into the conjunctival sac of the baby's eyes as best we can get it there. And we do not wipe it out afterwards. There may be a slight irritation or reaction, and that is not necessarily a bad thing because the baby has come into contact with some bacterial uh, from, to, from some bacterium in the vagina as during, during the delivery, so it's good to have that there to protect them. 
Vitamin K injections, again, we're giving the baby a, a shot of vitamin K that's given in the vastus lateralis, the only muscle we use on a baby for injections, to help stimulate the development of the clotting mechanism. A uh, baby doesn't have any bacteria in his gut, and that is where vitamin K needs to be synthesized to develop itself as a clotting factor. So until that happens, we will support that situation by giving him the vitamin K injection. Hepatitis B is the other, other injection that a lot of babies are getting now. Mothers have to sign consent for the babies to get this, but they will begin their vitamin um, or their Hep B series at this point in time, and that way they're protected for the rest of their life against hepatitis B. So you're going to do an assessment initially and then probably within an hour and then every four hours after that. Now it should be either a relatively full complete assessment, some do abbreviate assessments, but if you are there with the baby for longer than four hours, I want you to do complete assessments each every four hours if the nurses and the family are um, in agreement with you. So again, you're looking at posture. Baby should be flexed and not flaccid. Color should be pink and not gray, pale, or blue. Reflexes, we need to be looking at baby's reflexes. And there are 10 reflexes that are on your assessment form that the Ocala students have been provided. And those reflexes we will go through um, probably in a little bit. If not, we'll come back to those. Measurements, we're looking at head circumference, chest circumference, and in some facilities they actually do um, abdominal circumferences. Of course, we're going to do length and weight. Weight is um, provided in both pounds and grams. And as you see in the picture I have before you, they have grams of 3106, which would translate to about a six, and six pounds something ounce baby there. <coughs> The other measurement we do is gestational marker. There's a Ballard scale. Ballard scale, again, was developed to identify what the actual gestational age of a baby is by what his physical attributes are, not by what weeks gestation were based on an ultrasound. So we, there are two types of Ballard scales. There's an abbreviated that most of the facilities are using for healthy full-term babies. And then there's the full Ballard scale, which are used for more of the premature or questionable premature babies. So a an abbreviated Ballard scale is the one you need to know most, and I want you to review the full Ballard scale, which is in your textbook. Abbreviated, we're looking at four markers. One is the ears. The ears are cartilage. The external ear is a cartilage and very soft. And as you pull the ear, external ear, towards the eyes, you fold it over towards the eyes and let go, it should rebound back. If it does not rebound, this is a sign of prematurity. The second gestational marker is breast tissue. All babies have a little bit of a breast tissue, breast buds, because of the influence of mother's hormones. So there should be anywhere from three to five to seven millimeters of breast tissue. So pinch up the little breast to see what you get in between your fingers. Now, if you don't feel too much tissue there, this might be a sign of a, of a premature baby or less than full-term gestational age. The third marker is genitals. For the boys, we would expect um, to see a descended testes into the scrotum. And for little girls, we would expect that when you bring the legs flat or uh, have the knees straight and the legs somewhat together, the labia should cover the clitoris. Now, when they have their legs wide open, of course, the labia may not cover the clitoris at that point. But if you were to pull their legs a little bit together, you would see that the clitoris gets covered. In premature babies, that does not happen, and the testes do not descend. The fourth gestational marker for this abbreviated marker is the soles of the feet. If the foot is completely smooth, it's a premature baby. If the baby is two-thirds or fully with creases, this is a much more mature baby. So that is the four abbreviated gestational markers to identify that your baby is at full term, which is anywhere from 38, 39, and 40 weeks gestation. As we assess each system, we're going to do this um, relatively rapidly. And again, I want you to go into your textbook to review and to read. It's pretty self-explanatory. They do a very nice job of explaining. I've added a few pictures to some of these PowerPoints just to help you a little bit, because your textbook doesn't tend to use a lot of pictures for some of the outside the normal parameters. And I wanted to be sure that you had an opportunity to see some of that.
So in the skin, again, we're looking for color. We're looking for the pinkish color, a little bit of blue, which is acrocyanosis around the hands and feet, but you're not looking for any central cyanosis, and you certainly don't want to see a baby that was pink and now is pale, because that's a respiratory or cardiac issue that we need to address. Look for bruising. The most popular bruising is the one near the buttocks. It's called the Mongolian spot. We see this in darker skinned or pigmented babies, such as your Mediterranean, possibly Asian, African American, maybe even some of the Hispanic babies may have a little bit of a blue tinge. And I do have a picture of a Mongolian spot coming up later. Newborn rash, very typical for a baby to acquire a newborn rash hours to days after birth because he's been in a sterile environment and now exposed to all kinds of different textures and soaps. Um, and cleaning solutions and airborne things that he hasn't been exposed to before. So depending on the sensitivity of the skin, he may have more of a rash or not. Look for any type of lacerations that may have occurred during the delivery and make sure that we're keeping those covered and, and cleaned carefully. They're also looking for any type of nevi or what we call stork bites, um, little birthmarks, anything that you see on the skin that you would want to alert the parents. It's a normal phenomenon. Head. Head is, again, the skull bones, remember, are going to mold to come through the vagina, and that's called caput. I have a picture of that for you as well. Very normal, crosses the suture lines. The edema crosses the suture lines. In a hematoma, cephalohematoma, that does not occur. It does not cross the suture lines. Bears watching a little more uh, specifically can be a sign of a significant trauma, but oftentimes it is a spontaneous trauma that's happened and caused a little bit of bleeding or bruising in that skull area and will resolve uh, spontaneously. Check the fontanelles. There are two fontanelles, an anterior and posterior. The anterior fontanelle is much larger, and it will close at 12 to 18 weeks gestation, or, sorry, weeks of age, where the posterior fontanelle, which is much smaller, about the tip of your little finger, will close around six to eight weeks of, from birth. And again, we do not want those skull bones to fuse too rapidly because we allow for brain growth. The E and T I kind of all put together. For the eyes, the ears, you're looking for any drainage, of course. That would be significant of any trauma or infection. The eyes, we're looking for clarity of the sclera. And you want to see a red reflex when you use an ophthalmoscope and, and put the light into their eyes. You should see a red reflex, just as you do when you take a picture of someone and the eyes have that little red dot. That is a normal phenomenon. Without that, it's abnormality. Ear placement, we're looking for the eyes and ears and how they line up. External structures, again, the ears should be um, have firm structures, a cartilage that coil easily and rebound. The eyes, of course, you're going to see an eyebrow, some lashes. Sometimes babies have the most beautiful eyelashes. But you want to see the pupil and you want to see the sclera. But oftentimes, babies don't open their eyes very easily for you because of the brightness of the room. So you may have to work with that a little bit. And again, I said discharge. You're looking for discharge. Mouth. Open the baby's mouth if you can, or while he's crying, really inspect. With your little finger, your gloved little finger, you're going to place a finger in the back of his mouth because you're wanting to ensure that the, there is no cleft palate. Even if you don't see a cleft lip, you're going to look for the palate to ensure that the soft palate is intact. At the same time, you can assess the swallowing and the sucking reflex. Please check the tongue for uh, mobility. If his tongue is fixed, that is a concern and probably has to be addressed. Look for any type of natal teeth. We're looking at mucous membranes to ensure that they're intact and that they're moist. Neck, check clavicles. Check range of motion of his head. I know that sounds unusual, but there could be a neurological problem if his head doesn't move pretty spontaneously on its own. And again, you're going to move his head a little, and you. You're not going to crank his head one way or the other, but move him a little gently and see if there's any resistance or any activity in his part that would give you a suggestion that it was causing some discomfort. On his chest, I mentioned clavicles here. You're palpating equally on both sides for any crepitus or anything that feels like Rice Krispies under your fingers. Breast buds we've already talked about, and then you're going to auscultate the chest. You want to listen in all segments of the chest. I know this chest is very small. But you need to listen everywhere for sounds of crackling, wheezing, or absence. If you do not hear any breath sounds, that's suggestive of a severe anomaly called diaphragmatic hernia. Abdomen. 
Abdomen should be relatively round and soft, unless this is an IUGR baby or a small for gestational age baby where it might be a little concave and skinny. So you want to see a round, soft belly. You can listen with your stethoscope for bowel sounds. Check the cord. You want to be sure that the cord has three vessels, and you want to check that it isn't having any drainage. Um, no odor to it, and of course we're going to provide cord care. Each facility is a little different in the cord care that they're requesting in protocol. In most of our facilities that we're working in, we're still using alcohol at the base. And of course we would educate the parents of same to have that cord fall off. Because remember that cord is a direct um, cardiac line. Genitals, again we've already mentioned the male genital, the penis, the uh, urethra should be at the tip of the penis, not ventral or dorsal. The scrotum should be enlarged, a little bit red in pigmentation from the mom's hormones, and the testes should be descended bilaterally. The female, again, the labia will be a little bit edematous and reddened, pigmented from the mom's hormones. She may have even a little bit of bloody or mucousy, milky discharge from the vaginal opening. The labia should cover the clitoris, the clitoral hood. Um, but if not, it's not a concern, it's just a gestational marker. Me musculoskeletal system, again, we're looking for ex at the extremities. Are they spontaneously moving? If not, that might be a neurological deficit. Checking grasp, there should be a planter and palmer, or I should say palmer with hands grasp and a planter grasp. The Babinski should be intact, and we'll talk about that under neurological. Um, They should be, have free movement of all four extremities. We're going to check for uh, dysplastic hip. The DDH is um, developmental dysplasia of the hips. There is a procedure that the physicians and nurse practitioners do, and it's called the Ortolani maneuver. I would ask that you don't participate in this maneuver unless someone is with you and showing you exactly how to do it. But what they're doing is they're palpating the trochanter, the head of the hip, to identify if it is in alignment or not. And so they're listening for a hip click. Now there are four uh, dimensions of DDH from very mild to very significant. We want to identify that early so that we can have early intervention to correct the problem. The other issue would be club foot. All babies are born with slightly inverted feet because of in utero positioning. But if it's a significant inversion, then we definitely need to address and either do it um, either through uh, casting or maybe there'll be a surgical intervention to correct the deficit. Back and spine, we turn the baby over um, and check his spine for being intact. We even separate the buttocks and look into the buttocks for any dimpling where the tail or the very base of the spine would be that is suggestive of a spina bifida occulta. So that's why I called it dimples. Neurologically, again, those 10 reflexes. If we start at the top, the glabellar, you're touching his forehead, watching him blink. Rooting, you touch his cheek and see if he moves his head towards where you're touching. Swallowing, sucking, grasping. Babinski, uh, tonic neck, where you place his head in one position and he should have a fencing move that follows his head. Inter in truncal, curvation place him prone above the crib. You have to hold on to him above the crib. If he's laying on the crib, it won't work. And just touch the inside of one of his sides, and he should move both his shoulder and his hip into that direction. So I call it the tickle response. It's not the proper term, but that's what I call it. Then we have the stepping and the crawling maneuver as well. So in all, there are 10, probably more, reflexes that you could be tell. Oh, the moral reflex, which is the biggest reflex and the most significant because it gives you a pretty, it sums up their neurological status for you. You tap the crib or you pull on their hands a little bit and drop them an inch, not significant drop. And both their extremities should extend and retract spontaneously and symmetrically, and that is a complete startle or moral reflex. And those reflexes, again, are outlined for you with pictures on page 590 and 591. So that's your total um, reflex, or, I'm sorry, your total assessment of your newborn, including vital signs, of course, which I did not include since we had talked about that. Picture in the top left corner is a jaundice baby. This baby has hyperbilirubinemia. He's sleeping. Um, bilirubin causes babies to be lethargic a little bit as well. So you want, that's another key. 
The next picture is just a newborn rash. It can be relatively mild or significant to a new mommy. That would look pretty significant to you and I who is looking for an all total body rash. That would not be very significant, but it bothers her because she wants her baby's skin to be perfect. Don't have to put a lot of oils or lotions on that. It should resolve unless we deem that it is from a fungal infection. The next picture is that Mongolian spot we were talking about. It's usually across the buttocks. And we have to warn parents because they think someone has, has spanked or struck their baby. And we want to caution them that, no, this is a normal pigmented phenomenon. And it may resolve, should resolve. The next picture is Caput. This baby, of course, had a vacuum extraction delivery, however. So it's a little more significant than what we would see. But it clearly outlines the molding that those skull um, bones will do to facilitate the vaginal delivery. That resolves usually in about 24 hours. Dysplastic hip, if you look at this, now the right hip or one under the R is normal. The other one is completely separated from the acetabulum and so will have to be corrected either um, through diapering or some type of brace or harness. There have, there's a pavlic harness. There's some different um, techniques now that are used, mechanisms that are used. Next picture is a club foot, pretty significant. You see it's a very severe inversion of that foot. The last picture you see there is called gastroschisis. This is a baby that was born with a defect in the abdominal wall, which allowed the gastric contents to be outside the baby's body. Now, this is done um, surgically or with a what they call a silo procedure. They place all of that into a nice sterile silicone-like bag and suspend it over the abdomen th so through gravity the bowel retracts back into the body instead of us trying to stuff it in there and causing probably obstructions or rotations so it is a much better means. Again, some of these are normal phenomenon, some of them are abnormal, but again it's about early recognition so we can have early intervention. And that's just a tip of some of the things that you will see. Anything that you feel looks odd or different, please alert one of the nurses or the physicians. And they can either, either educate you on how normal this new phenomenon is, or thank you for pointing that out to us, because we're going to now investigate. And some of the students have indeed found some issues. Billy lights, if a baby is jaundiced and needs to be under billy lights, this just gives you some pictures of different kinds for different things. Oh, excuse me, and for different um, bilirubin levels. Bilirubin is assessed through serum levels. Daily care, and this is some of the discharge teaching that we would provide for our babies. Babies don't need to be bathed except every 48 hours. Now, that's not to say that their peri area shouldn't be, or their perineum shouldn't be cleaned after every diaper change to ensure that we don't have urine drying on their skin or feces drying on their skin, which is a causative agent and will cause some skin breakdown. But, and probably around their neck, because they really don't have necks, right? And they don't have uh, elbow, they're all fat and creases, so you have to kind of get into some of those creases. Cord care, again, every diaper change, we should either use soap and water on the cord or some alcohol, depending upon the facility and the pediatrician's instructions. Diapering, babies go through anywhere from 8 to 12 diapers a day. We would expect 6 to 8 urine diapers, and then they should have um, stooling, two to three to four times. Sometimes babies stool with each feeding until their bellies kind of get regulated. Eating, breastfeeding every two to three hours, please, at 15 to 20 minutes per side initially until the milk comes in. If they're bottle feeding every three to four hours and no more than an ounce probably for the first um, week. Bonding, of course, anything we do with our babies, we should have direct contact with them. Tactile, visual, um, voice contact with them. There's an old adage that if you hold the baby too much, they'll get spoiled. That's probably not true for the first few weeks. Babies are learning that trust versus mistrust and knowing that their needs are going to be met is how they develop. And they can get stalled out in the trust versus mistrust. So if their needs are not met, if they do not bond with a primary care provider, be that mother, dad, babysitter, whomever, if they're not having a bonding where they feel safe, and responded to, they will get stalled out in that very first initial developmental stage of Dr. Erickson's. Some of the other procedures we'll briefly talk about is circumcision. It is an elective procedure by the American Academy of Pediatrics. It has been deemed an elective 
cosmetic procedure, not a necessary medical procedure. Hence, insurances and Medicaid do not pay for this procedure anymore. There are three types, and on that little picture there you see to the top is the GOMCO. The bottom left is the Mogan, and the bottom right is a Plastibel. These is, one is not preferential over another. This is completely based on physician's interest or, or comfort of using these procedures. So he'll choose the type of circumcision he's going to do. Your role is to get a signed um, consent from the parents, because it is a surgical procedure, so there needs to be a consent. Then educate them on the care of the baby circumcised or circumcision after. The number one issue is voiding. Is the baby voiding post-procedure? That is key. Babies usually are not discharged from the hospital or the office until they can void or with parents' instructions to be checking for wet diapers frequently. The other thing, of course, is going to be a red um, tissue area, red wet tissue area that needs to heal. And so we like to keep that covered with a jellied, um, jelly gauze, except for the plasti bell, which stays in place until it heals and then kind of pushes the bell off. But um, Agamco and Mogan is going to require some um, gauze petroleum jelly or some type of oil gauze placed on the penis, head of the penis, to protect it from the diaper sticking. And of course, we wouldn't lay the baby on his abdomen, but we're not laying babies on abdomens anyway to sleep, so it's protected that way. But if he pees, it's going to burn, so we're going to have to be pretty vigilant and reactive to changing the diaper pretty rapidly after voiding or stooling to protect it and keeping it very clean. PKU is just what the old-fashioned term for the metabolic screening that we do now for babies. And in your textbook, it goes through multiple metabolic tests that are done for babies upon discharge to ensure that he doesn't have any of these genetically linked uh, metabolic risks. Most of them are diet-related and can be corrected gone uncorrected, they can lead to some pretty significant cognitive delays or mental retardation. Some of the high-risk newborns that we need to talk about, of course, are the premature babies. These are babies born less than 37 weeks. The things that we would focus on, of course, is lung maturity. Do they have the surfactant to support? Now, we know that surfactant is available as of 24 weeks functional at 32 weeks, but fully functional and mature at 36 weeks. So if a baby's less than 36 weeks, he probably doesn't have the surfactant circulating in the lungs to keep them open during respiratory. So the respiratory effort becomes much more significant. And we will see retractions, we will see nasal flaring, and we will hear significant grunting. The other thing we look for is cardiac circulation. Is this baby's cardiac circulating the blood appropriately? Neurologically, babies are going to be immature. They may have the grasp. They stay, they relative, this baby is a relatively flaccid looking baby, though he does have some extension of, ex, of his extremities. Um, but the sucking and swallowing, is it mature? Um, he may not respond to pain in the same way, so we have to be watching for that. Uh, babies with multiple pain episodes are going to re, start to withdraw. Withdraw brings its own developmental risks. And we want to be cognizant and watching for that. Some of the iatrogenic issues for prematurity also that the nurses and doctors and people working with these babies have full control of is retinopathy of the newborn. That is from the oxygen density that is placed on the baby. It's not the amount of oxygen he's getting, but how much oxygen is, is in his blood from the oxygen we're giving him. So we need to watch for that. Blindness is a real problem for babies in NICUs, and so we're now having um, ophthalmologists actually coming and examining the newborns for detached retinas early on in the process and monitoring that. BPD, or um, bronchial pulmonary dysplasia, can cause chronic lung disease or, or chronic lung scarring. And this is where we force too much air into the lungs or we give um, artificial mechanical respirations for too long a period of time, which can cause some scarring of the lungs. And again, that's going to lead to long-term life problems with possibly asthma or respiratory infections or COPD or other respiratory risks. Cerebral bleeds, intra- and periventricular bleeding can occur, which, depending on the site and the amount of bleeding, can have some long-term brain injury. And neck is called necrotizing endocolitis. 
this can happen either even in the younger full-term babies where the more we feed them, because we give PO feeds right away, the more we feed, if there's an obstruction or an inflammation of the bowel, it will cause an obstruction and the belly will start to distend, get distended and we're not going to hear bowel sounds clearly. So again, do not negate listening to bowel sounds on a baby. This is a serious problem. This can kill babies, necrotizing enterocolitis. It requires antibiotics, possibly surgical intervention if the obstruction becomes too large and a colostomy. So can you imagine a little six-day-old baby with a colostomy? And all of these things can be prevented if we're doing if we're being vigilant in our assessments and carefully paying attention to what we're seeing and measuring and not trying to skip any of the steps. IUGR or SGA babies, of course, are their own problem. Who are at risk for developing IUGR? We said the hypertensives, the moms who smoked, the moms who did drugs, the moms who didn't eat well, those babies are at risk for developing IUGR and of course they do not have any brown fat. So they're at risk for cold stress which causes hypoxia, which causes comas and which can cause death. Hypoglycemia possibly, their blood sugars might be a little bit lower because they don't have anything there to burn off. They're burning off their normal sugars instead of that brown fat um, which can cause a lack, a lag and they become lethargic. If they're lethargic, they're not going to eat, so they're not going to return or they're not going to refurbish or bring back their blood sugars. Then the other thing, of course, is the jaundice. IUGR and SGA babies are at higher risk for jaundice um, because of if, they're, if they're immature and small, their liver is going to be even more immature. The other problem that can be included in this scheme or with any babies is called TTN, transient tachypnea of the newborn. It's usually a very temporary situation and will resolve spontaneously with perhaps a little oxygen. But we initially note it because their pulse rate gets a little higher, their apical pulse rates get higher, their respiratory rate gets a little bit higher, their pulse ox is dropping a little bit because they're breathing but they're not clearing their lungs of the fluid and so they tend to overcompensate by breathing faster and their heart rate may, may elevate a little bit. So again, it is usually a transient problem, hence it's called transient tachypnea of the newborn. But watch for it because it can be resolved. Neonatal pain, again, there are what I've learned from your textbooks, that there, there are 35 different scales that are used, some specifically for premature babies and some for the full-term babies. But there is a pain scale and we need to recognize that babies do have pain and we need to assess their pain as we do with anyone else's. Again, as I mentioned for the premature baby, if they go un uh, treated or mon unmonitored for pain, this can cause some withdrawal, which could cause some developmental delays. And we want to avoid that, especially if it's something that we could avoid. NAS is um, the mnemonic for neonatal abstinence syndrome or withdrawal. I have left a video in your module regarding this uh, phenomenon. It's very significant. We're seeing more and more babies now withdrawing, um, either from nicotine or from other much more substantial drugs. It requires, for some babies, it's just a few days, and for some babies, it's a few months before they're completely cleared of the substance. The controversy lies in whether mom is going to breastfeed or bottle feed. Some nurses agree with the breastfeeding, and some are very opposed. So I'll let you do your own. Uh, just, in fact, that is a discussion question that will be coming up, whether or not a mom should breastfeed if a baby is withdrawing from the drugs that she continues to take. Some non-pharmacological pain management that we can offer our babies and we do it for circumcisions as well, is distraction, talking, singing to our babies, um, telling them little stories, cuddling, walking, rocking babies, and tactile stimulation is very good. I should have included that tactile, just touching them, um, slapping them on their butts, and I don't mean slap, but you mean just popping them on their rear ends a little bit, just to give them that motion, or having rubbing their back, rubbing their heads, rubbing their tummies, they like that too. Non-nutritive sucking, giving them a pacifier or something to suck on. It does release a, an epinephrine if they're sucking, and so that helps soothe or calm them when they're uncomfortable or in pain. And we, a lot of the nurses will also use a sucrose substance, either glucose water, sugar water, or a sugar substance that they put on a pacifier or on a gauze that they will suck on. Again, epinephrine release 
and their pain sensors or their pain perception decreases and the need for anything else is resolved. Now that's not to say we don't treat appropriate pain. We can use non-opioid or opioid medications. The key is we have to ensure titration very, very carefully because the size of these babies and the fact that we have liver immaturity. Remember, the hepatic system is not mature. Some other risk factors we need to remind you of, of course, if mom has diabetes that's gone unchecked, babies can have lung immaturity, so the surfactant levels may not be um, there and they may have some difficulty in breathing, so we may see appropriate initial APGAR scores, but then the APGAR score may get worse or we might start seeing some respiratory distress. The other huge problem, and I say that tongue in cheek, is macrosomia. Again, macrosomia is large body. So the baby's chest is larger or equal to the size of the head and the shoulders tend to get stuck. If this happens, the risk of a fractured clavicle is huge and or Herb's palsy. And the picture you're seeing there is a baby actually with Herb's palsy. This baby's, of course, a little bit older. And you can see his Herb's palsy in his right arm has not resolved. What you're going to see is a uh, externally rotated arm, fixed arm. He will not move that except straight, and he will never move it above probably the chest area. That hand, whether it's functional or not, I cannot tell from the picture, so does he have a grasp or not? Herb's palsy is where the nerve endings in the shoulder are actually evulsed from the spinal cord, which meaning they would have nerve damage or destruction. You never want that to happen, of course, because then you end up with a significant Herb's palsy. Oftentimes, though, because these babies are still growing, still maturing, still developing, we might have a little bit of regeneration. So we're looking always for the grasp of the hand after a shoulder dystocia delivery. If he can grasp his hand, those are distal neurological sensors. So if he can distally respond neurologically, then we know the rest of it is OK. It may just be bruised. And we'll just take some time to allow some edema to go away. And in the meantime, we will continue with some passive range of motion and some physical therapy to help improve that neurological system in his arm. If you Google Herb's palsy, you will see adults, though, that still have significant arm lag. Of course, diabetes also lends itself to jaundice because um, the liver is immature and you have polycythemia, more red blood cells in diabetes and thicker blood, so you have a higher risk of blood cells that have to be destroyed, hence higher risk for jaundice. So diabetes comes with these risk factors. Hyperbilirubinemia, again, we've talked about it being a function of the liver. Jaundice comes in two flavors, pathological and physiological. Pathological is usually defined as that jaundice, those elevated bilirubin levels we see prior to, I repeat, prior to 24 hours and after seven days, or lasting longer than seven days. <clears throat> that is the pathological, meaning that there's something wrong with the baby's liver. Physiologically, very normal, happens a lot. We see it very often in breastfeeding because breastfeeding babies tend to get a little dehydrated. And I'm not saying significantly, but they're not getting a lot of volume, and they're not getting a lot of fluid, and they're not getting a lot of proteins, which helps break down the bilirubin. So breastfed babies are going to have higher rates of physiological jaundice. Diabetes, we just talked about, could have some physiological jaundice. And a traumatic birth, skull trauma, um, the clavicle trauma, femur trauma, any type of trauma during the birth can cause a rise because that's when the, the blood responds. The white blood cells, the red blood cells respond. If you have any breakdown or any type of bleeding, too, that's a breakdown of red blood cells much more rapidly and platelets, and so you're going to have more risk of jaundice. So you should be watching those babies for higher levels of jaundice earlier on. So how do we treat jaundice? Because we want to prevent kernicterus, the um, far abnormal sign. When bilirubin levels get to 12 and 14, it's usually a sign we will start to treat. But I've had babies come back into the hospital with levels of 20, 21, 25, significant risk of brain damage. So treatment is the Billy Lights. And we keep the babies under the billy lights relatively naked, so then there's a risk of cold stress. 
We want to feed them much more frequently and ensure that they're getting larger volumes, especially of proteins and fluids. So either mom has to breastfeed much more frequently or we're going to supplement her breastfeeding with some formula. A lot of mommies don't like doing that, but it's going to be based on what the bilirubin levels are and how significant the risk is. And once you sit down and explain that to moms, they're more than willing usually to cooperate and work with you, as long as you're also willing to help them maintain their breastfeeding. <laughs> and again, watch for your heat source. Post-term babies, one of the biggest problems is meconium. So I've lent you a picture because you may never get to see this. That's a baby that has been bathing in meconium because they pass their meconium in utero. Usually it's from some type of stressor, cord wrapped around their neck too tightly, a partial abruption, a traumatic event during the birth, a hypoxic event during the birth that caused him to release his sphincter past the meconium. Now the baby that you see there that's covered in that yellowish green Vernex has been swimming in meconium for a while. So it's an event that occurred quite some time ago. The biggest risk is if that meconium gets into their lungs. And that usually doesn't happen unless they take a, a nice big breath of the meconium. So we do some suctioning. There's a lot of controversy right now whether we should suction or not suction at the time of birth. And so I leave that open for your own research. Um, we have gotten, had good re results with suctioning. And then, of course, the placenta on your right shows you it's also green tinged, so that baby's been kind of swimming in that meconium for a while, which is not a problem as long as it doesn't get into his lungs. But his skin has been tinged, which will wash right off. And the placenta has definitely been tinged. And if you note, the placenta has a knot. I'm sorry, not the placenta, but the cord has a knot. So that is a significant reason why this baby had a little bit of stressor towards the end, because already the perfusion is decreasing, and then we add a little knot to the cord, so now you have a double whammy for perfusion issues to the placental bed and to the baby. Also, if you look, the placenta is inserted at the edge, I'm sorry, the cord is inserted at the edge of the placenta, which gives you a battledore, a battledore uh, type of placental embedment, which is a little bit riskier as well. The other big factor, of course, is your LGA, large for gestational age, or macrosomic baby, because those babies can become extremely hypoglycemic. You know, and I forgot to mention that with the diabetic baby. Hypoglycemia is the other big risk. Mom's been giving this baby all this sugar. Now the sugar's taken away. He's still making insulin. He's going to have a hypoglycemic event. If we do not recognize it, he can become comatose. And if we do not recognize it, he will die. So a hypoglycemic baby is lethargic, and what does he need? He needs to eat. Well, he's not going to eat if he's lethargic. So we may have to force feed him some formula. And again, if we explain that to parents, they will understand it. But it's kind of a vicious cycle. Both jaundice and hypoglycemia cause lethargy in babies. Neurological issues, we always want to watch for ICP. And if we are suggesting that there is a bleed, any type of cerebral bleed from trauma, a hematoma, a force of delivery, a long-term birth, or a, uh, just any type of traumatic birth, we'd want to watch for signs of ICP. That'd be a high-pitched cry, irritability, restlessness, or possibly even lethargy because it's gotten so high that it just shuts his systems down. Check the fontanelles for bulging. They should be flat and soft. Anencephaly is another problem. I did not include a picture, but you can Google anencephaly, and you will see this is a baby without a brain, born with a brain stem, but without brain, so will not have any cognitive abilities, but does have the ability to breathe and cry and be hungry. Microcephaly, usually a formation from alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, microcephaly, there is no treatment. And anencephaly also is incompatible with life. Now for spina bifida, we said we would track the spinal cord to look for any dimpling or bulging in the spinal tract. And of course, with spina bifida, we should always be watching for hydrocephalus. So we would be measuring head circumference. We measure head circumference on a baby until about three years of age, just to ensure that there's not any problem developing later on. And again, there is a video that's been embedded in your module that talks about the interuterine repair of hydrocephalus. Pretty neat, um, cutting edge stuff. Some other GI issues, cleft lip and palate we've already talked about. We've talked about necrotizing intercolitis, and we've talked about gastroschisis. 
STIs, I'm sorry, neonatal sepsis. Again, babies can be exposed to any of the STIs that mom has had, if she, especially if she hasn't completed her treatment or if she's been reinfected and we're not aware. GBS is something we're very, very aggressive about. As we've talked about in labor, she's going to be treated with antibiotics if she does have a group beta strep infection. Babies, especially at-risk babies, such as your small for gestational age, IUGR, premature babies, or a susceptible baby for any other reason, can die from the pneumonia that's caused from any of these bacteria. So pneumonia can lend them to having a neonatal sepsis. And remember, their immune system is not real strong yet. And so babies can go into a pneumonia very rapidly and can succumb to the, um, to the syndrome very rapidly. So again, our interventions, if we feel a baby has sepsis, and these are babies that are lethargic, they're not eating, their temperatures are either elevated or subnormal, uh, vital signs are skewed, their respiratory rate is elevated. So we're going to note their respiratory rate is elevated and irregular. They may have periods of apnea. We're going to find that their pulse oxes are decreasing. They're not going to be interested in eating. We're going to have to watch INO very carefully to be sure that we are replacing fluids and keeping their electrolyte balance in check. And we're watching their activity, of course. And they're going to be flaccid and, leth and lethargic. This has been an overview of those three chapters. I do expect that you're going to have to read through, but this is a highlight to help explain some of the things to you. If you have any questions, I suggest you go back through this video, write down your questions, email them to me, and I'm happy to answer anything I can.